178,000 men, 150 tanks, 1,100 aircraft, 1,600 guns, German side, 54,000 men, 100 tanks, 300 aircraft, 500 guns, and Soviet side. These were the figures at the beginning of the fighting in Stalingrad. These figures and their evolution during the fighting will be explained in detail throughout this video and their sources will be discussed at the conclusion. 54,000 men, 70 tanks, 900 aircraft, 1,300 guns, German side, 33,000 men, almost no tanks, 1,500 aircraft, 2,600 guns on the Soviet side. This is the figures at the end of the German offensive. But first we need to clearly define the scope. The stats we'll be looking at concern the fighting inside the city and not the operations that developed around it. German 8th, 11th Army Corps and 14 Panzer Corps were deployed along 6 armies' northern flanks as far as 100 kilometers from Stalingrad, where they were joined by the Romanian army, whereas 4th Panzer Army was deployed south of the city. They were facing the Soviet 21st, 28th, 51st, 57th, 64th, 65th and 66th armies deployed west on the Don River and south in the Kalmyk steppes of the Volga River. But when it comes to Stalingrad proper, the German unit that led the assaults were 6th Army's 31st and 4th Panzer Army's 48th Corps. The latter's units were soon subordinated to the former. That's why the stats for German side will be all about 51st Army Corps. On Soviet side, the streets of the city and the industrial zone were defended by 62nd Army alone. So the numbers we'll see here reflect the strengths of those units only. Does that mean that they were the sole to decide the fate of the city? Absolutely not. As already seen in previous videos, the flanks always remain strategically important, even before the Soviet counteroffensive in November. Accordingly, the chosen period corresponds to the German attack on the city from September 13 to November 19, 1942. After this, the fight in Stalingrad is no longer the focus of the operations and the statistics are no longer relevant. So, to summarize the scope, we can say that rather than reflecting the whole campaign for Stalingrad, stats in this video will tell about the fighting in Stalingrad. Speaking about sheer numbers, at the beginning of the fighting in Stalingrad, there was no overwhelming German superiority on the paper, except in aircraft and artillery, where they outgunned their opponent by a factor of three. If we consider the number of men fighting inside the city, there was an advantage on German side, but the advantage was not enormous. The real German advantage was elsewhere, tanks, artillery, aircraft, supplies and ammunition. In terms of troops, what made the real difference was resilience, tactics, and reinforcements. It soon proved that the Red Army had the better of these. But at first, the situation did not look so good. The spirits of Soviet troops were at the lowest. They had been fighting for two months while slowly retreating for hundreds of kilometers and finally they had been driven back all the way to the Volga River. 
On the other side, German troops were jubilant. They were in range of the final objective of this year's campaign, the Volga River. Their formations were in far better shape than the Soviet, although clearly not full strength, since they had engaged into fighting all the summer. And as time went on, the effect on the morale slowly inverted. The Soviet anguish transformed into determination, then into a new hope. Whereas German illusions for a quick victory gave way to bewilderment and then despair. The Soviets had managed to draw their opponents into what they could not win, a war of attrition. But at first, the situation did not look so good. On the Soviet side, there were many units, but all of them were a mere shadow of themselves. Some divisions had barely 10% of their authorized strengths. Some armored brigades had no tanks left whatsoever. The average strength comparison shows that German divisions began fighting in Stalingrad with a deficit of 4,000 men, which is one-fourth of their authorized strength, whereas Soviet divisions had a staggering deficit of three fourths. On the eve of the first urban assault, September 13th, Soviet 62nd Army was but an aggregate of depleted units with poor command and control. The day after the initial assault, 62nd Army received the old famous 13th Guards Division and its 10,000 men as reinforcements, which basically allowed the Soviets to continue fighting instead of losing the city straight away. Until December, the pattern for Soviet forces was very much the same. 62nd Army received new units as reinforcements every three days or so in September. Then every five days or so in October and known in November. In addition to new units sent into the city, reinforcements continued to flow in throughout the entire period with small groups of men crossing the Volga along with supplies and ammunition. This constant flow maintained the army at more or less the same level, although attrition wore on and the overall forces slowly diminished. The pattern for German 51st Corps is slightly different. Instead of a constant flow, reinforcements arrived in three major waves, each one just before a new offensive. As the assault in city center was over, and the offensive to the industrial district was preparing, 100th Jaeger Division was sent in. For the most powerful offensive in October against tractor and barricades factories, it was 305th Infantry Division and pioneer troops. For the attack on the Red October factory, it was 79th Division. Each time the reinforcements were very consequent. They consisted in strong forces arriving as big formations at once. Then for the last German offensive in November, some reinforcements were scrapped up out of the few remaining reserves, but it was clear that 6th Army's resources were spent. As a result, the overall amount of Red Army troops sent to reinforce 62nd Army in the city was something between 80,000 and 100,000, although it's difficult to precise. 
On German side, only three divisions were transferred to the city as the fighting reached its maximum intensity and sent to 51st Corps, which was the main striking force from the beginning to the end. The rest consisted in pioneers and a few sporadic reinforcements. The overall total is about 35,000. Regarding armored forces, there was also no clear disproportion in the initial stages of city fighting, at least on the paper. Two Panzer Corps were operating in Stalingrad area, 14th and 48th. Although there were over 100 tanks in 14th Panzer Corps, most of them were deployed to face the Soviet armies between the Volga and Don rivers leaving a small portion on leave for operations closer to the city. 48th Panzer Corps committed about 70 tanks for the offensive in the southern part of the city. Both combined, the Panzer Corps provided about 100 tanks, but that was not all. The Wehrmacht fielded something that the Red Army lacked at this time of the war, and that was assault guns. In the ruins of Stalingrad, the low-profile Stugs made the difference. Most of the assault guns available in 6th Army were assigned to 51st Army Corps for use in the city, with a total of 43, and the remaining 18 Stugs were also to be directed to Stalingrad after a few weeks. For leading the initial assault in Stalingrad, German forces are thus credited with a total of about 150 tanks and assault guns. A figure well under Soviet estimations, sometimes referred as 300 tanks, which is over the total tanks in the entire Don Volga region. On Soviet side, the main armored force was 23rd Tank Corps and a few separate tank brigades. They were severely depleted after fighting on the approaches to the city, but still fielded about 100 tanks. According to the archives, a large part of the remaining tanks in 62nd Army was destroyed on September 13th as German troops entered the perimeter of the city. A total of 29 tanks claimed in 6th Army report against 16 claimed in 62nd Army report, which amount respectively to 30% Soviet and 10% German total strength in Stalingrad. Then again the quick attrition pattern. Very few new armor joined the German forces after the beginning of the fighting but damaged German tanks could be easily sent to the rear and repaired, contrary to the Soviet, which were at best becoming fixed firing points. German Air Force, taking part in operations over Stalingrad, consisted in 8th Flieger Corps and a Luftwaffe 4, with about 1,500 aircraft in total, but due to high turnover, for maintenance, only about 1,000 of them were actually available on any given day. Soviet Air Force, the VVS, consisted of 8th and 16th Air Armies, which together amounted to about 400 aircraft only, among which 
only 300 were operational. As a result, during the first stages of the battle, their courageous pilots were flying near hopeless missions over Stalingrad. As time wore on, the balance of power was to follow steadily inverted trends to completely revert in 1943. Just like the Air Force, German artillery outnumbered their opponents at first, with 1,500 guns supporting 51st Army Corps in the city versus 500 for 62nd Army. Then the trains became in favor of the Soviets so that by the end of November they already assembled the formidable artillery force of every caliber on the far side of the Volga River, about twice as strong as the German, which suffered from attrition without receiving any reinforcements. So, one word about the sources used to retrieve the figures used in this video. First, there is, of course, David Glantz's Stalingrad trilogy, and especially Volume 2, which is Armageddon in Stalingrad, and which deals uh, with the fighting inside the city. That's for the authoritative Western study. On Russian side, we've got the academic study by Alexander Samsonov, uh, The Battle of Stalingrad, published in the USSR. And we have the more recent work of Alexei Isayev, uh, which is the most recent auth Russian authoritative study, which has done a wonderful job of going through the archives to retrieve facts and figures. And yes, finally, we have my own little contribution, which includes reports and strange returns and diaries from German units as well as Soviet units, and which does this for every single day uh, during the entire period. So let's hope you enjoyed this video and see you later.